Yeah, this is my third Startup Grind event. Startup Grind does a ton to help communities all around the country, all around the world. But Startup Grind, Techstars hopefully also really inspires entrepreneurs, helps them out along their journey. And it's amazing the kind of companies that come out of things like this. You first meet them here, they end up building huge, amazing businesses and creating amazing innovation. So that's what it's all about. Startup Grind team in Boise is incredible. Bringing the community together, led by Jess and, and everybody, um, you know, educating entrepreneurs, helping them meet each other, helping push them to push each other to the next level. I, I walked in the door, I was just, I've, I've heard about it, I've heard the rumors about Star Brian Boise, but I had to see it to believe it, and, uh, and it was uh, in its best form here tonight. Hi, I'm Mark Solon, managing partner of Techstars. Startup Grind has injected incredible enthusiasm into the Boise startup ecosystem. Just like Techstars, which operates under the mantra of give first, uh, Startup Grind is doing everything they can to help entrepreneurs here in Boise. Welcome to the Startup Grind. Let me introduce to you our CEO from Palo Alto, Derek Anderson. Um, well, I'm I am just so thrilled to be here. Uh, you, you know, I when I first met Jess, Boise was on my board. It was Silicon Valley, New York, Tel Aviv, Hong Kong, Boise. Okay, <laughs> that was the order. I knocked out the others, but I didn't have Boise. Um, and so, uh, but it's just been amazing to, to kind of hear about you all and to, uh, to hear the stories and to watch the videos of, of the amazing speakers that you had and the stories. There's some amazing entrepreneurs in the city. And my experience is I, I've lived eight, eight, eight years of my life outside the United States. And uh, I moved to Silicon Valley about 10 years ago. I'm from Florida. But my experience is that no matter where you, where you look, where the, it could be in Iran, it could be in the Gaza Strip, it could be in Rwanda, it could be in Mongolia, there are great entrepreneurs everywhere. And, um, and to, to see the speakers and to see the people that are coming to Boise, you know, um, uh, I met pe members of Chambers of Commerce, I met the, you know, different people from the SBA, I mean, there's just, it's, it's kind of all coming together through uh, what the work that Jess is doing and this great team, what they're doing, and through people like Mark and, and um, you know, and other people in the ecosystem. So. Um, it's a great, great pleasure for me to be here, and I don't have to do the interview, and that's really awesome. I can just enjoy it, like all of you. Thank you for being here. If there's something in the spirit of Startup Grind, and also Techstars, whose values are, are almost identical to ours, I, I, and sometimes I, I feel like uh, if somebody looked at them, they might say I plagiarized uh, Techstars' values, which I, I did, I later learned our values are, are almost identical, but Startup Grind is... Um, it's, it's all about helping somebody. It's all about giving before you take. It's about making friends. So if you, don't, if, you, if you leave here tonight and you haven't helped somebody push their startup ahead, you need to consider yourself a huge failure. So look to the person to your right and look to the person to your left and figure out how can I help this person. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Jess, and the team. Thanks, thanks, thanks. He's a managing partner at Techstars. Can, let me introduce everyone stand up. Mark Solon. Um, you know, I, I started Highway 12 back in 2000. It was a very different environment. It was on the heels of the, the dot-com implosion. And, and for most of that first decade I was here, there, there wasn't a great deal happening in the Boise startup community. And I really feel, I, I wrote a blog post maybe six months ab ago about it, but I feel like there's more going on here in the last year or 18 months than in the the 12 or 13 years prior to that. And it's, it's really exciting. This is a great example. Look how many people came out tonight. Um, so I just want to take a couple minutes and tell you about my partners at Techstars. It's an incredible privilege and honor to work with these folks. Um, they all come from remarkable backgrounds. Start with Ari. Ari grew up in Silicon Valley. He's a, he's a geek's geek. Um, he's been playing and tinkering with technology since he was a kid. Um, he started a company called Filterbox back in 2006, seven. And Ari went through the very first Techstars class back in 2007. So he's one of the first 10 companies to ever go through Techstars. Nicole Gleros, also been around, were you employee number two or three at Techstars? She's been around, Nicole ran nine programs at Techstars. She's the most tenured managing director. She's now our chief product officer and a partner in the fund. 
Um, Nicole last year was written up in Entrepreneur Magazine as one of the 11 most influential women in technology in the country. <laughs> Jason Seitz, uh, again, a, an amazing entrepreneur. Started a company uh, a few years back called Slicehost, bootstrapped it, never raised any money, wound up selling it to Rackspace. What year was that? 2008. 2008 became, uh, once he in got integrated at Rackspace, became VP of Engineering at Rackspace, was there over the dramatic rise that they had over uh, five or six years. And then we were lucky enough to attract him to Techstars where he ran our, Austin, our cloud program and our Austin program and just ran his last program in Austin and is now full-time partner on the fund. And I don't even know what to say about David Cohen. You know, we've been friends and co-board members, and and um, you know, there's a, so much been written about David. He's a prolific investor. He's invested in some of the most successful companies in the world. The first uh, investor in in Uber, first round of of capital in Uber, and other great companies like Sengrid and Twilio. He came up with the idea and pitched it to Brad Feld for TechStars back in in 2006 on the back of a napkin. And today, his notion of give first resonates all over the world. It is, it is such a privilege and honor to work with these folks. What I love about this group of, of uh, people that I get to work with every day is we really try and think differently than most venture capital firms. Um, when we sit around investing, we, we, we have conversations about what is everybody not investing in? And um, we sat around the table today, we had our, our partner meeting, and we approved, uh, I think, our fifth or sixth investment, a Series A investment today. And it was in a company that we'll announce in a, in a few weeks here, hopefully shortly, but it's something that no, nobody, no other VC firm would even consider investing in a company like this. And that's what I love about them. Everybody really wants to invest in companies that are making a dent in the universe, not the you know, 27th entrance into an enterprise mobile space. Um, so without further ado, Jess, um, let's sign, shine some light on these guys. Okay, so David, let's start with you. Will you give us a little bit of a background of Techstars, what it is, get us a little intro level. Right, yeah, that would be helpful probably. Uh, people know what we're talking about up here. Um, it's great to be back, uh, first of all, and, and yeah, thanks for having us and, and the great space as well. Um, <coughs> so Techstars actually started uh, in 2006. Um, we ran our first accelerator program in 2007. It's this idea that we'd get together and provide a little bit of capital um, and a lot of mentorship. So we got the whole community in, in a little town called Boulder, Colorado. Anybody know Boulder? Yeah. A um, couple, couple, yeah. Um, and and we, we had about 100 mentors and we funded 10 companies out of 302 that applied to come you know, spend time in Boulder and um, work on their companies. And it, it kind of grew from there. So we, we've been largely known as you know, that accelerator thing. Um, and I think you know, that's grown over the years to where today the scale is um, much larger. We have 18 accelerator programs like that um, around the world in, in places like Chicago and New York and Los Angeles and Berlin and London now. Um, and so 18 times a year we fund these 10 or so companies. They get about $120,000 each and we spend three months with them. And we learn as much as we can about them and try to help them as much as we can through the mentorship and, and this global network um, that we're putting together. So ultimately, that, that's what we're trying to create is a, a network that uh, helps give entrepreneurs unfair advantages, helps them be successful, and that involves the alumni and the mentors uh, around the world. Um, and so we run accelerators in, in two different models. There's the uh, sort of city programs that you're probably are familiar with, so Techstars in Boulder or New York or Chicago. Uh, but we also run accelerators on behalf of some of the biggest corporations in the world now, most important companies like uh, Disney, and Barclays, um, and Ford, and others. And these are our way of uh, sort of verticalizing or focusing in an area. Obviously, Ford be focused on mobility, uh, Disney on entertainment, and so on. So when you see those accelerators, that's us running them too. Um, that's obviously a huge part of what we do. We also have venture capital funds. That's what the five of us focus on. Um, across the system today, we have about 300 million in, in venture capital to invest in, in companies coming out of the ecosystem. And the other part is a little newer for us. It's, it's more reach through our community programs. 
Um, many people know Startup Weekend or Startup Next. There's about a thousand of those around the world every year. Um, so we operate that as well. So the whole idea is, is how can we help entrepreneurs through their journey, right, with um, community programs, with uh, accelerators, with capital, and try to do as much as we can to help them be successful. So today the scale is quite big. We're about 130 or so people now, 140 or so. Um, but we're an incredibly distributed company, right? Our, I think our biggest office is like 20 or 25 people. So we've kind of grown up in this live everywhere mode. And it's fun to be a part of so many startup communities that are growing and doing amazing things. So now Nike is another one of your verticals, right? Yeah, so, so Nike was uh, doing a program with us um, kind of in the digital sport, so health fitness. Um, and that, that it's really fun to work with brands like that. You know, it's uh, to watch them kind of go out of their way to, you know, the give first thing that you were talking about. I'm hoping one of the things that, you know, we're all doing when we, we come out with this mantra, this philosophy of, of give first is you know, teaching others the, the value of that. And to, to see corporations suddenly like, not asking for anything, but being incredibly helpful to these companies. You know, people like Bob Iger of Disney walking in, um, you know, Mark at, at, at Nike just walking in and saying, how can I help? Uh, and the startups kind of look at them like, wait, this, this is, what's the trick? You know, you're, you're fooling me. But over time, they're learning that that's how you actually should engage with the startup community. So I hope that's one of the meta impacts of, of what we're doing. It's a huge impact. So Mark was telling me that he one time walked into Nike, and there's the CEO sitting with some of their entrepreneurs just on the couch, helping him go over notes and stuff. And I yeah. thought, when do you get access like that? You know, I, so this vertical idea is just brilliant. I love what you guys are doing. It's fun. I mean, I, I was in uh, L.A. the other day, uh, the Disney Accelerator, and one of the entrepreneurs showed me their calendar. And it was, you know, Tuesday. It was a regular Tuesday. It was like, you know, Bob Iger at 10 o'clock, and then the, the CEO of ESPN, and what was the other one? There's one, there one other just, you know, huge companies just meeting three CEOs in like the same day. And, and they sort of look at you in the end and go, like, how did you do that, right? And they're, they're literally getting feedback from these incredible people that have done so much and have so much access to help the company, right? So it's, it's pretty crazy to watch. So I want to hear what are you looking for? Anyone can answer here. What are you looking for in your investments as the Techstars Ventures now? And how do we get you to invest in Boise? <coughs> Jason. So the, the fund uh, is aimed at investing in the Techstars ecosystem. That's the way we like to talk about it. And, and the way that we define Techstars ecosystem is basically companies that we are close to because of the activity of running accelerators and being Techstars. So that could be companies that go through one of our accelerator programs. It could also be companies that are founded by alumni that went through a program many years ago and are starting a new company. It could be companies that are founded by our mentors. So David mentioned that Boulder, you know, when they first started, there were 100 mentors in Boulder. Across the system now, we probably have, you know, 2,000 mentors that are all entrepreneurs and operators in, in you know, a dozen plus cities around the world. And so all of those people are doing interesting things and building companies, and we get to learn a lot about how they are and how they think by watching them help early stage companies in the accelerator format. So that visibility and then the, the last category are basically just companies that we think of kind of as friends of Techstars that we're just close to, that, that, that come to our events, that we spend time with and that we get to know. And so from a, from a kind of strategy and philosophical level, um, the, the, the thing that we're trying to manage with the fund, the, the risk that we're trying to, to manage down is we want to we want to invest in people that we have material runtime with. We want to invest in, in entrepreneurs that we've had time to watch, operate, perform, see how they are in good times and bad times. You watch, you see a lot of, of a facets of a company during a three month accelerator program. You see what they're like at 2 a.m. when everything's going the wrong way and just you know that how they handle that adversity is. Is a, is a huge input into how we think about um, how we're deploying capital. So. Thank you. Okay, so Nicole, I have a question. What does the first day of Techstars look like? You got a company coming in. What does that even look like? It's kind of a crazy day, to be honest. I mean, one of the things that makes the Techstars program really special is the the how the teams get together with each other. Right, so one uh, we really focus on at Techstars is helping the companies form a bond between them 
that is really strong that can exist for life. So regardless of whether this company works or not, they have a support structure around them forever. So we spend a lot of time the first day trying to establish, in the first week, trying to establish trust between the companies, trying to help people get out of their shell, trying to help people lean on each other, um, and trying to help people really form that group that can help be supportive throughout not only the Techstars program, but, but forever. So it looks a lot like, you know, some, there's some social stuff. There's a lot of play time. There's a lot of hard work. There's a lot of really honest feedback. There's a lot of talking about intellectual honesty and testing that in, in out in the wild, right? Like, what do you suck at? And, and are you, you know, what, what things do you suck at that you maybe, not, maybe don't want to admit to yourself? And then how can we as a group help you be better at those things or build support structures around yourself when you can create that um, support structure around you? Uh, not only within your company, but outside of it. It's a really powerful thing. That's one of the reasons why Techstars is so great. That's awesome. So Nicole is brilliant at telling you how to ace your elevator pitch. Will you, will you give everyone a little lesson real quick? So it's better to workshop. <laughs> it's a mini workshop. This is educational. Yeah, all right. We need a victim. Uh -oh, this Who would like to workshop their elevator pitch? Startup. Where are our startups? All right, right here. Come on. Have a seat. All right. Does he need a mic? OK. So here's the thing about the elevator pitch, right? It's 20 seconds. You're actually in an elevator. And you got to let everybody know what you do in 20 seconds. All right. So we're going to help you workshop it live. So you can give everybody your elevator, and then we're going to critique it. So hey, real quick, before you do that, let's, let's set the stage, mm -hmm. which is um, when you do a workshop like this or when you, when you get feedback, um, it, can, it can be a little hurtful sometimes, right? <laughs> No because crying, you think, there's no, no crying no, in because, startups? Is that because you think, because you really want to do well, but remember that everybody in the room is here to help your pitch be better, right? right? So everybody, you can't be negative, you have to be constructive, right? Hey, that's a good addition. Thank you. Um, and the goal is to make him awesome, and then as you guys do that, hopefully you'll learn how to make your own elevator pitches better too, right? Okay, so let's hear your elevator pitch. My company, PC TechMate, is a cloud-based computer repair program to help IT admin save, save hours of time repairing sick computers by completely automating the process. Oh, so be really, really honest. Who does not understand what he does? Raise your hand. Raise him high so he can see. Okay, so that's maybe like 20. Yeah, let, let's, yeah, no, that wasn't bad. That wasn't bad. Who, if you get it, if you get it, if you totally understand it, raise your hand high. Who never raises their hand to stop? Right. <laughs> right. Who's, who's afraid to raise their hand? Okay, so for those of you that did not raise your hand, you have to remember that entrepreneurship is a community-based activity. You can only help the community get better by participating and giving feedback and helping one another. So if the guy next to you or the girl next to you did not raise your hand, punch him in the shoulder. <laughs> right? Don't do it again. You're here to help each other. All right, so I actually thought it was really good for a first time. Like, I kind of got it. I don't understand the how, and I sort of don't understand if it's real. So th we, ha we have a saying at Techstars around, like, you want to lead with your, your most powerful thing. So, like, if you're do I don't know, do you have revenue? How much, rev do you have do. How much revenue do you have? Can you say? Just under 40000 a year. So, okay. So, so, so far. Okay, so that's great. So, and how long have you been in business? Can you answer? 18, 18 months. Okay. So it's still early for you guys. You're still sure. proven out, but that's okay. Now, is it a software-based flat? It's a SaaS-based program, yeah. Okay, and is it something that, like, so I, the thing that was confusing to me, I don't know if you guys got this, but it was, I, I didn't understand the how, right? So I heard a bunch of buzzwords. So we have a saying at Techstars, which is generic language is deadly. So if you use a bunch of, hey, we're a cloud-based SaaS service that helps PCs not be sick anymore, like, I kind of get the industry that you're in, but I don't get the how, and I don't understand how you're different from everything else that's out there. So if you to focus on the how, not the who you are, but what you do, that'll be a little bit more clear. So why don't you try again, but tell everybody what you do. Like, say the how. Yeah. The magic is the automatically, or uh, automating the process. So uh, if I pick up the computer and throw it down, you have software issues. No, but that's a hardware <laughs> issue. <laughs> you fix the software? We fix the software part. We fix the OS. When something gets by your antivirus and, it, and breaks something, there's nothing available that actually fixes what gets broken. 
antivirus will pick and get rid of the malware itself, but there's nothing that fixes what that malware breaks. And that's what we do in real time. Do you install an agent? We do install an agent. Okay, so that's actually all getting, so you're getting closer to the how, right? We install software on a local machine that once malware is detected and removed, goes in and repairs, right? Right. Is that getting closer? That's close. Repairs the gap, something yep. like that? Yep. Something like that? Okay, so it's in the how. Keep it under 30 seconds, though. <laughs> No, that's what's that's the trick. That's what's hard about elevator pitches, and that's why you can't just like write an elevator pitch and think you're done. You have to workshop it live like this, and you have to get feedback from people to understand what's clear and what's not clear, right? And you do it live with feedback from the room, and I don't know. I thought it was pretty good for a first time, right? There you go. That's brave. You're brave. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, so Ari, I have a question for you. Sure. Um, Ari's specialty is in the unmanned aviation space, so I would love to know what you're seeing trend-wise out there right now. I don't know. I don't know that it's a specialty. Maybe it's a uh, a passion or a fascination of mine. His secret hobby just yeah, goes flies his drone. I do. I, I, I do fly drone. Um, what I'm what I'm seeing is a proliferation of companies all over the spectrum in the in the. UAV space. I mean, there's everything from selfie drone flying cameras all the way to large-scale unmanned full-scale helicopters for firefighting. Um, the truth is drones have been around for a long time. We used to have this idea that they were flying killing machines. Um, the truth is that anything that can be remotely controlled, you know, at scale or at distance, you could call a drone. So I think that the label's a bit misused. But what's happening now in, in the industry as the venture funding has increased, year over year, almost doubling year over year now. Uh, the number, we're almost at 100 venture funded companies in the space now. And what, what's happening is starting to segmentation. So in the early days, it was a couple hardware companies and they were consumer facing companies and all of everything they did was just ver vertically integrated. So now you've got companies that are just doing ag, just doing like wind farm or pipeline inspection, just doing real estate filming. Um, there's software companies that are focusing on infrastructure and compliance and making it safer to fly. Uh, there's also companies that are, cre that are creating systems just around command and control um, so that you can fly flight patterns and manage a huge fleet of drones uh, without ever having to actually like be at the sticks and controlling them. So Charging companies, infrastructure companies. Hi hybrid motor companies to get quadcopters up in the air for hours at a time. Right, you know, one of the things people don't realize is the little quadcopters, the DJI Phantoms and the uh, the 3DR solos, these things can fly for 20 something minutes, best case. So they're great if you wanna pop them up and take a couple of pictures or do a short filming stint, but for commercial operations, whether you're looking at a, uh, you're looking at a traffic accident, you're using it for forward looking, you're using it on a battlefield, you're using it for intel, th those birds have to be up for way, way longer. And so still a lot of that industry is fixed wing. And so there's lots of new technology coming in to make these things safer and easier to fly, deployable in more places, um, so you're starting to see specialization, but it's still a very nascent market. So, it's what would you say is opportunity in this space? Opportunity? I think there's I think there's opportunities everywhere. I think the hardware side of the market you have to be really careful in because uh, eventually that's a race to the bottom, a com a, you know, a commodity game, and a couple of vendors are going to end up emerging. Um, what you're starting to see is hardware vendors be successful in verticals. Um, so if you go narrow and deep, you have a better chance there. And then I think some of the biggest opportunities are on the software and operations side uh, because they scale horizontally across all of the verticals that are using them commercially. That's great. Mark, will you talk to us about local scene? What can we do as a community to get louder, to get more focused, to get Boise on the radar across the nation, maybe in Silicon Valley or wherever? Uh, success. Success begets success. I mean, if you look at Boulder, um, you know, when I started investing in Boulder at, through Highway 12 Ventures, uh, we made our first investment in 2003 in a company called Atlas Software, which Google wound up buying in 2007 or 2008. Uh, Boulder was a sleepy college town. There wasn't a ton of startup activity. There was no foundry group. There was no tech stars. Um, and it w wasn't really on anybody's radar screen. And they started having some success. And, um, you know, a company would get, Atlas Software was bought by Google. I think there were 35 engineers at the time. How many Google engineers in Boulder today? A couple about of, to about to be a, 300 going to a thousand, 300 to going to a thousand engineers that, that um, 
Google buying this little software company. In a city of 100,000. In a city half the size of, of Boise. So, you know, I, I've spoken about this before. I'm sure a lot of you have heard this. Um, ProClarity was bought by Microsoft here uh, a handful of years ago. Um, 65, 70 employees at the time, and Microsoft wanted to build a big campus here and use Pro ProClarity as the base. And it wound up not working out because we didn't have the educated workforce and the engineering talent to, to keep that going. Um, so it all really all starts with, uh, at the beginning, K through 12 math and science education. Well, yeah. so is that how you did it? I mean, how do you sustain that pipeline in Boulder? One, you know, one of the things I think that helps is, and, and this is something that Boulder did well, is when the success starts to come, like do a really good job of telling the story and use the rising tides model. So if you help amplify some other company's success in town, and that's sort of a reciprocal thing, then the, 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 you know, the, in, the, the little bird becomes a chorus, a crescendo, whatever, and people start paying more attention. And one of the things that really worked in Boulder was as companies started to grow and raise rounds and find some early success, we were all talking about it, blogging about it, tweeting about it, and it helped put the activity on the map so more people start to lean in and pay attention. I think this is a fabulous take home for us. Yeah, Mark. I was just going to add, you know, we've got some companies here that are amazing. You know, you've got Cradle Point, which is a huge company now. It started as a small venture back company here in Boise. Ballyhoo, T-Sheets, there's, there's a lot of interesting companies that I promise you over the next couple of years will either go public or get bought by large technology companies. And hopefully, you know, with the recent activity, um, we're going to be able to attract and keep large technology companies that, that acquire those companies. And then after the lockup period ends, you've got engineers with great ideas who are going to go start new companies. And if you look I, I, a lot of the engineering talent and, and startups here in Boise can be traced back to HP and all the great engineering talent there. And that's how Silicon Valley grew. It all started with HP in a garage back in Silicon Valley. So um, I think success beget, begets success. And then, you know, David Cohen spoke here a few years ago and somebody asked David, you know, what do you think of Boise? And I remember distinctly David's response was, I, I can't hear you. And, and what he meant was, like, th there is no real voice. Um, government institutions can't do it, and Idaho Technology Council can't do it. It's, like, got to be entrepreneur-led. And it, it takes, you know, the, the entrepreneurial leaders to create a voice and a platform and use that platform. And, you know, Rhino, that's going to be a big responsibility of yours. Uh, when I said, I ca uh, we can't hear you, I just actually didn't hear the question. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, I'm not sure... Um, it's cool that you remember it that way, though. Um, well, here's here's what I like to do for for questions like this. Um, do you guys like interactive, like you know, stuff? Do you like to interact? Cool. Do you like yoga? No, I'm kidding. Um, so, so I can I ask you if if you're an entrepreneur, just the active entrepreneurs, could you just stand up? Thanks. Nice. And it, it, here's the trick. Awesome. That's really cool. Give yourselves a round of applause. That's awesome. Yeah, stay standing. Okay, it's really important that you not sit down just yet uh, until, until I give you a break. You have to stay standing up, okay? Because entrepreneurs, like, we, we, we have endurance, right? Um, <laughs> if you absolutely love, like, I'm talking love, Boise, could you stay standing? And if you're not sure you love it, could you just sit down? Not sure, you can be honest, you know, absolutely love it, stay standing. No one's going to come after you. That's cool. Okay. You don't know that for sure. Stay standing. Okay. This is all being filmed, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> if, you're, if you're positive, barring, you know, death or, you know, some, some horrible event like that, you know, global, global thermonuclear war, stuff like that, don't, don't worry about those kind of things. But if you're going to still be here in, in 20 years, will you stay standing up? And if you're not sure that you will, just go ahead and sit. So 20-year entrepreneurs that just love it here. Okay, so, so everyone else that's sitting, look at these people. Just take a look around. These are the people that will build this entrepreneurial community. Right? These are the only people that can do it. The entrepreneurs, it's always entrepreneur-led. Some of us are venture capitalists or you know, service providers. It's great part of the ecosystem. These, these are the people that will build it. 
And these are the people that love it and will stay here long enough for that to matter. So give these people a round of applause. Thanks. In it, Bo, taught, Bo was the founder of Tripod, the original portal to the web, if you remember back in, in, the, in the day. And Bo wound up selling his company to, to um, I think it was Yahoo, um, and rode the stock up and became a multimillionaire during the dot-com craze. And Bo wrote a great book called Lucky or Smart, you know, which was I? And one of the, the things I'll always remember about this terrific book is Bo said that a CEO's job of, of a startup is you are always selling. You're always selling your stock. You're selling your stock to uh, recruits, people who you're going to try and convince to come work for you know, far less than they can make in the open market, um, f work you know, triple the hours that they would work in the open market. I mean, let's face it, what you're doing is an unhealthy pursuit, right? And, and you have to be able to sell that vision to investors. You have to be, in, uh, be able to sell that vision to customers. So more than anything, a founder of a, of a tech startup specifically really has to always be in sell mode. You have to be a great salesman, a great evangelist. And that's why so many CEOs, um, founders of tech companies, wind up not being great CEOs you know, two or three years out once the company be becomes successful and has a lot of people working for it because then you're managing people and, and, and you know, managing finances and all of that. But the first couple of years of a startup is about evangelizing that vision that only you could do and that's how you get people to co come do that. You know, Techstars doesn't operate in Silicon Valley. Um, we invest there but, you know, we go around and we, we always say, you know, we're not at all anti-Silicon Valley but we're kind of pro everywhere else. And I, I think we don't need more valleys. I think we need more bridges, right? And, and you're a bridge now, right? You've, you've done it, right? So you can help others in the community do it. So it, it is about the super connectors, people in this community that are trusted, not just there, but in Boulder, in New York, in Boston, everywhere else to, to do deals together. Because still in Colorado, most of the capital comes from outside the state. So it's those bridges that really matter. Andy K Kessler has this great quote um, saying that money sloshes around the globe looking for good ideas. And it, it's, a, it's actually quite true. I mean, money finds great startups. I don't, somebody raise their hand and tell me like an amazing startup that, that they know of that didn't get funded. Not, not a mediocre, or, but like a world-breaking idea that didn't get funded. Because really, it's ideas that change the world that should get funded. Is that trying to understand at least First of all, understand the investors that you're going after. What kinds of deals are they looking at? What kind of stages of companies are they looking at? What kinds of things do they need in order to feel comfortable making an investment? Um, in the early days, like I think an entrepreneur is always raising money, but that doesn't mean you're actually actively seeking capital. It means you're always creating relationships, right? So starting with those relationships early and asking investors, hey, you know, if this would be something that would be interesting to you, what kind of milestones would you like me to hit? But basically getting a general understanding of where you would need to be. And in the process, that creates a relationship. Um, there's another great blog post that's called Lines, Lines Not Dots. So when you go out to pitch a VC for the first time or an investor for the first time, they only get that snapshot of what your company looks like. But if you have a relationship with them over, the t over time and they can start to see the progress that you're making over time, a lot of times it becomes much more interesting to them. Right, so finding uh, investors early on that, that believe in you, that like what it is that you're working on, and you can demonstrate that you can execute and make progress, I think is a great way to go about it. At what point is it like to raise money? I can't answer that, right? But it's never too late to start developing relationships and getting feedback from investors on what you're, what you're looking for. I've been informed Mr. Cohen has a joke. I think, I always have a joke. I, th I think it's when someone hands you a mic in front of five investors is a great time to pitch. And I kind of say it half joking, but I think lots of ad units flying by here when people get handed a mic, right? Like, hey, I'm David from Techstars. We're the best you know, ecosystem in the world for startups. And I have a question, right? Like it's a simple thing to kind of create more awareness for your thing. And I totally agree with the relationship building on the serious side. We're asking questions about community building. I was thinking about Brad Feld's Startup Communities book, which is an awesome book that everybody should read. But one of the stories he tells about Boulder in the book, or, or one of the guest writers tells, is the, is the tradition they used to have, I don't know if it happens anymore, of, of having a startup wake when a startup fails. So, so you, when the startup just like goes out of business, shuts down, they have a party to celebrate the effort. And it's, it's a, such a little thing, but 
what that really is doing in essence is it's is it's broadcasting at a community level at a gut level that it is okay to fail at building a company like you're not ostracized you're not you don't hang your head in shame and just leave town like it's expected that you're going to do that more times than you're going to succeed that's that's just part of the part of the gig i mean so like those that sort of attitude is really really s strong to have here and just to add one more thing to that it's not just about celebrating the failures but it's supporting those people that took that risk right so part of the startup wakes that that we ran were hey your company failed how can i help you need a job you need contract work you need support what so making sure that as a community you guys are supporting each other when that happens is really critical so a person knows that they're being backed the prototypical company has changed over time. When we first started, it was very, very early. Now companies look anything from ideation, companies that actually don't even have a company built and they're still trying to figure out what product they're building, all the way up to somewhere about $2 million in revenue or funding. And we have examples of that being even north. Some of our corporate programs um, will have companies that have, are even a lot farther north of that. So, But that tends to be the sweet spot in there. Um, but really, the thing that we're looking for is amazing entrepreneurs, great, great teams. We say team, 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 um, market, traction, idea. So that means a team that knows how to execute, that's passionate about their idea, that has an amazing dynamic between them um, in, a, in a big market. Um, and traction is, can be product traction, it can be company traction, it can be user traction. It can just be like making a lot of progress over a short period of time, right? Um, and then idea is the last thing. So that tends to be the sweet spot of stuff we focus on.